Hey, it's good to see everybody. It's really amazing. Not only is the auditorium almost full here, but we have, I think, 200 Zoomers out in Zoom space uh, somewhere. So welcome uh, to all, all of you uh, for coming. And uh, it's a little soggy today, but uh, luckily, I think the, the weather cleared up for us. And um, my name is Mark Martindale. I work here at the Whitney Lab. And I'm going to introduce our speaker today. And I just wanted to remind you that this is an installment of our Evenings at Whitney series. And next month, we are going to have another exciting speaker, uh, Manny Holford, who is going to be talking about uh, cone snails and the toxins that they make and some of the biology of these animals. And not only are they beautiful animals, but they, they have many um, sort of secrets uh, to their biology that it's a, it's a, has a extreme biomedical relevance, for example. And I think you'll be very interested in hearing her story. Uh, but today, uh, we are here to uh, listen to Joe Kistel, and um, he is a Florida-grown boy. Uh, he grew up down in uh, Fort Myers, I believe, the Fort Correct. Myers area, and um, went to Thank college you. up at the University of North Florida, so he's, uh, he knows the state quite well. Uh, he was scheduled to speak here a couple of years ago, and you know what happened uh, to, after that, and so we were very lucky to be able to get on his schedule uh, tonight. But um, uh, Joe is actually kind of funny because um, he knows Whitney pretty well because he confessed uh, <laughs> over dinner that he used to come down here in an old white Ford Ranger and um, borrow seawater <laughs> from our seawater system for uh, his animals up, uh, up in Jacksonville and uh, at UNF. So um, he, he knows the lay of the land down here pretty well. And it's really exciting uh, to have him here tonight. Uh, he's one of the amazing people that has um, figured out how to um, cash in, if you will, uh, his ability to um, uh, um, have a natural curiosity about the world and uh, his hobby of scuba diving. And uh, many of us <laughs> have one or the other, but we very few of us are able to actually um, share both of those things in our uh, everyday life. So it's really, uh, it's really fun to be able to listen to him speak. Uh, he is a cinematographer, videographer, uh, an author, uh, a parent, uh, <laughs> and uh, on the side. And um, uh, he's uh, used uh, his experiences, and you'll see this evening, to really sort of champion marine conservation and just uh, understand uh, our appreciation for what lies under the water uh, that we look out over uh, all the time on our daily walks and things like that. So. Um, without uh, any further ado, I will uh, let Joe uh, have the stage. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. And first off, thank you, Mark and Heather, for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight. I really appreciate any chance that I can come preach about what's underwater. I'm very biased and passionate about uh, the local marine world we have here. And since he mentioned the story, I thought I'd put a little bit more color into it. Yes, I went to University of North Florida, and at the time I went, I did want to study marine science, and UNF at the time really didn't offer much hands-on marine science. So I convinced some of the staff there to let us build some research aquarium, and once we built the aquarium, we realized we needed seawater, and I realized that Whitney Lab pumped in fresh seawater. So we literally bring down a little small faculty truck at like midnight, because that was our college schedule, the only time we do it. We would borrow trash cans from UNF, bring them down here, fill up this tiny little truck with fresh seawater and take it all the way back up to UNF. And, the, and it worked great. It was, it was great water for what we were doing. So kind of a, in a different position here today to be up here talking to everybody at Whitney Lab versus borrowing seawater. So greatly appreciate the opportunity. Um, this is kind of a fun slide to start with. And I, I looked at it walking in here in the big screen and, and and just now I realized it kind of looks like the old shark or the Jaws image. And instead of Jaws, it's, it's me looking at a very nice boat. But this is an image actually that I kind of get in my recurring dreams. And you see, when we go diving, we, we, we have a lot of friends with boats. We charter boats. We do whatever we can to get out. And we're, we're very grateful for the friends that we have that will take us out. But no matter what boat we're on, when we jump in the water, when I come back up, I'm always yearning for a bigger boat to get on. And it is a... a it's a known disease known as two foot itis. And if anyone has a boat out there, you're very familiar with this, no matter what boat you're on, you always want a bigger boat. And I can confirm that two foot itis is chronic and severe because this friend's boat here was the boat we yearned for coming back up on. 
this boat has recently been replaced with a boat that's about two feet longer. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Harold. <laughs> um, but I am excited. What we are gonna talk about um, as much as I can in the little bit of time we have is, is what is underwater St. Augustine or what's just offshore our coast here. And it's really amazing. This image here is just kind of a, 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 a good introduction image of what you might see. If you went offshore, jumped in the water, swam down to the bottom and you're on some sort of reef or structure, you're very likely to find a, a, an image that might look like this. This is a blue angel fish. This is something that's very common in the Caribbean and Keys. And for people that may not be aware, may think those fish are only from down there, but this is a very common fish on our reefs up here. Pretty much on every dive, we will see blue angel fish. Um, I don't know how to, <laughs> but. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of a nice little introduction image there. But the reality is there is a ton of interesting things on the seafloor just off the coast of St. John's County. And so <laughs> you can kind of get, this is kind of a slide that gives kind of a real quick representation of some of the variety of things we have. But essentially what we have is we have a variety of structure offshore. And what we're gonna talk about tonight, we're gonna talk about natural reefs, we're gonna talk about artificial reefs, we're gonna talk about aircraft. We have a lot of aircraft offshore for various reasons. We're gonna talk about some historic things as well. But at the end of the day, all these things are structures and they kind of serve the same purpose, at least as far as marine life is concerned. All these structures are rigid bodies. Rigid bodies provide real estate for organisms to attach to. And I'm gonna say this in some different form multiple times throughout this presentation because it's kind of the key concept. The rigid structure provides real estate. Things can encrust and grow in it, corals and sponges and a great diversity of encrusting life. That encrusting life in turn provides resources, shelter and food for many other organisms. And at the end of the day, these underwater structures provide an ecosystem that benefits pretty much the entire marine food web. So St. Augustine has a ton of structures, a lot of variety, and each one of them is really amazing. So again, tonight, what I'm gonna talk about is a couple categories of those. We're gonna talk about natural reefs, we're gonna talk about artificial reefs, and we are gonna talk about plane wrecks and a historic wreck as well. I wanted to give you guys an idea of the abundance of these structures, these reef sites that we have. And don't get too overwhelmed with this image. All this image is, is a Google map image where we have taken coordinates that we are aware of and plotted them. These coordinates have come from multiple sources, a lot of fishermen, a lot of divers like ourselves. And this is just some of the numbers we have databased over the years. And you really can't get an idea how many dots are on this screen because we're zoomed way out. If I were to zoom in close, everywhere you see a dot, once you zoom in closer, the dot would expand about 10 more dots. There's a lot of things offshore. Each one of these dots represents something as small as an aircraft wreck to as large as a football field. So we're not gonna have time to talk about all this stuff today, but I just want you to be aware that there are quite a few things just off our coast here. If you're curious about the red lines, um, that just kind of shows the county boundaries of St. John's County. We use this image in, in sort of a, a request to the county looking at pulling new permits. The green box was kind of an area of interest where we recommended considering doing more artificial reef permits. So first things first, I wanna start with natural reefs, reefs, or at least what I refer to as natural reefs. And essentially what a natural reef here in Northeast Florida is an exposed rock. Uh, rocks sticking out of the sand, out of the seafloor. So if you imagine the beach, it's all sand. Most of our underwater seafloor looks like that, but occasionally you get some areas where you have this, these rock ledges that pop out. And these rock ledges, again, going back to structure, are structure, and they become encrusted with coral sponges and all these animals I've talked about before. And essentially, you get all the marine life that comes that feeds and, and benefits from that structure there. And so our natural reefs look something like this. This is a typical ledge reef offshore uh, St. Augustine. And you can kind of get an idea. You can see the, the rock ledge. It's, I think most of our uh, rocks are either sandstone or limestone. But you can see it kind of sticks out. There's some re relief underneath. That relief provides shelter and ambush uh, areas for big predators and then small fish as well. And then all the exposed rock is completely covered with a variety of these organisms that grow on the rock. And here's a closer look to give you an idea of some of the diversity of that growth. One of the 
prevailing visual things that we see when we dive, especially in a natural reef, are sponges. We have a great diversity of sponges up here in Northeast Florida. And it's pretty amazing, at least to me, when you think of diving down in the Keys and the Caribbean, in some places, or even more so historically, you would see a lot of stony corals of various colors. We, don't, we do have stony corals, but we don't have the variety that you would get in the Caribbean. But what we have to offset that variety is a variety of sponges and these sponges come in various different colors. So they're, they're really neat to see. And this image shows you know, a few of those sponges. And you can see how these sponges make habitat in addition to food, they provide shelter. I, I don't know if you can see it for well, but it, yeah, I guess you can at the, at the very top of that sponge, there's a little sea bass that's kind of just sitting and resting in there. And then you can also see there's some cardinal fish down the bottom. You see a lot of fish swimming around, but anyway, our natural reefs just have a ton of life and just a lot of diversity going on. So they really need to see. What I'd like to do now is I would like to just show kind of a short video that highlights these natural reefs a little bit better. And hopefully we can make this work. Here we go. Welcome, I'm Joe Kistel, and this is the Underwater St. Augustine channel where we showcase the amazing recreational opportunities just off the coast of St. John's County. In this video, we head offshore St. Augustine to visit a reef called Pontevedra Grounds to explore underwater as scuba divers and experience the diversity of marine life the natural reef offers. One of the first flashes of color encountered is often a damselfish jolting around eagerly. They are typically a vibrant blue and yellow and hang out in structure on the sea floor. Erratic movements are the fish aggressively protecting their homes, which is a small area in which they eat algae and small critters, take shelter, and even spawn. They want this area to themselves and so spend their days defending it. If looking more closely at reef structure, a diver will likely see a small red fish with two distinctive dark spots. The diver is staring at a two-spot cardinal fish. These fish take refuge during the day and become active at night. Sometimes a cardinal fish with a swollen face will be encountered, and this is actually a male incubating fertilized eggs. Now in a short period of time, these eggs will become juvenile cardinal fish that will inhabit the reef. Now spend enough time observing cardinal fish and a diver is bound to be approached by a curious blue angelfish. These fish are frequently observed by divers and make for excellent photo subjects for their beauty and willingness to be photographed. The juveniles are an extra treat to encounter. They have a different look and even more vibrant colors. The angelfish consume primarily sponges and that is one of the reasons they make offshore St. Augustine home. Sponges of many shapes, colors, textures, and sizes are dominant underwater features throughout the region. Where typical Caribbean reefs may be more known for stony and soft corals, Northeast Florida reefs are likely some of the best to observe sponges. These sponges provide many resources to the overall reef, including serving as a food source, as well as shelter to many of its marine life residents. One of the many fish species that appreciate sponges are black sea bass. Sea bass are a dominant fish species on our reefs, being encountered on typically every dive. They are generally observed in a darker brownish color, but can change their color and pattern appearance based on their environment and behavior. Where the sea bass lacks in vibrant colors, it makes up for in personality. These fish love to investigate anything new on the seafloor, including scuba divers, and even seem to enjoy the reflection in a diverse mass. And even though they are a smaller fish, they are sought after by recreational fishermen because of their fight and high food quality. 
One creature is harder to spot on St. Augustine reefs than others. However, once it is spotted, it is one of the most impressive creatures to observe. Octopus are curious, wanting to examine by touch anything close by. They also have the amazing ability to dramatically change their color and texture. Truth is, there are too many underwater subjects to feature in this one short video. There's just an overwhelming amount of marine life found at the Ponte Vedra Grounds Reef. The site consists of rock formations jetting out from the sea floor. The exposed structure provides areas for things like coral and sponges to grow, which in turn provide food and shelter for many fish and invertebrate species. Amazingly, the site is only one of many reefs accessible from St. Augustine, any of which are a recommended must-visit attraction for scuba divers and those interested in offshore fishing. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more videos featuring the offshore and underwater world of St. Johns County. So um, that is that was just one of our ledge reefs. Again, that was that particular site off Ponte Vedra, um, about 20 miles or so east, probably around 80 feet of water. Now we're going to segue from that to artificial reefs. One of the things about what we consider our natural reefs are there's not necessarily uh, a super abundance of them. There's quite a few, but from a fishing standpoint years ago, it wasn't perceived that there were a lot of these natural reefs to fish. And so what happened back when fishing technology and boating technology allowed people to get offshore and start fishing, fishermen realized that if they placed structure in the water that they could create a new fishing destination. And that's how the artificial reef program started. And over the years that process has been highly refined and it's much more uh, eloquent today than it was back then. But essentially the takeaway is the same. When we add the appropriate structures to the seafloor, we can create marine habitat that will both attract fish in, but then it will also produce as it gets a little bit older. So this is a typical artificial reef or good representation of an artificial reef offshore Northeast Florida. I like this image because it, it I think in one image, it kind of is a, a good, a summary of everything that's going on. In this particular situation, this reef structure was made of recycled bridge railing. This site's between 20 and 30 years old, and you can, you can kind of make out some of the bridge railing there. But if I didn't tell you that, you might have a hard time recognizing what the base structure was. But anyway, ultimately what happened is over the years is that structure became completely grown over, again, with these organisms, these corals and sponges, algaes, barnacles, and, mussels and so on and so forth. And you can even see a good variety of that here. You can even see some Gorgonia corals and some other things, some anemones as well. But all that growth is providing resources. And again, it's shelter and food primarily. If you look real close, you can see some very tiny fish. Those tiny fish are likely benefiting from the shelter, the growth and the structures providing. There's some larger fish there that are likely predating on some of those smaller fish. And then you have a top tier predator, the shark, that is likely predating on some of those mid-sized fish. So this image here kind of shows how an artificial reef can support an entire marine food chain. And this is a very good representation of what our typical artificial reefs look like offshore. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a recent artificial reef project. Back in 2018, two barge loads of recycled concrete. This is a barge here, this is one of them. This particular barge load is filled with concrete from gate precast. They provided an entire barge load of concrete. It was kind of like their scratch and dent surplus. They filled up our barge with it. In addition to that, they provided these structures here, which they refer to as double T's. Typically, this is a structure that's used to build like uh, carports and elevated buildings. So what they did is they made uh, several sections of this material for us to kind of provide a material that might replicate the natural ledges I just showed you. So we took these two barge loads offshore 
And we took them to a, a permitted reef area that's due east of Michler's or Mickler's, depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, it's about 12 miles east of the beach, literally straight east, and it's about 70 feet of water. We have built several artificial reefs here already. That's what these red circles are, rep are representing. And we've had very good success with those. So we thought this would be a good area for this reef as well. Another perk to this reef site is it's, it's equal distance from both the Jacksonville Inlet and the St. John's Inlet. So it's a 20 mile run from either inlet. And we place these structures there. And we always like to revisit these sites as much as we can within the first year to kind of monitor what's happening. And every time we do, we're really amazed at how fast things evolved. All these pictures I'm gonna show you here, the next three or four or so, were all captured well within a year of these materials being underwater. So in this first image here, obviously you can see some of the structure. These were some concrete pilings that were on the second barge load. And you can obviously see there's a, a Goliath grouper already there. Now, we all know that that Goliath grouper didn't just spontaneously produce itself on the reef. So that's a fish that likely came from somewhere else. And it very likely came from one of those other nearby reefs I just mentioned. Having said that, it could imply that this Goliath grouper is there because this new reef is already providing the resources that that Goliath grouper needs to be happy and healthy. So this fish may already have a food source on this reef. It already has a shelter, obviously. So it's probably already happy there with what resources this new reef is already providing. In addition to that, if you look a little bit closer to the structure, you will notice some texture on the structure. That concrete, when we put it in the ocean, was bare, clean, a nice smooth surface. But now you're starting to see some three-dimensional bumps and things on the structure itself. And what that is, is that's some of this growth happening already. It's a diversity animals growing on the structure. And you'll also see kind of a green film and that's an algae and you'll see some bare spots kind of in here and over here. And those spots are bare because these are sea urchins and the sea urchins have come in to graze that green algae, they like that. And when they graze that green algae, it actually helps with some of these slower growing organisms. If you look at these, if you see some bumps on there, most of those bumps are types of barnacles. But if you look at these little white spots, that is the start of stony corals. So they grow quite a bit slower than some of the other things, but there's already, uh, they're already kind of embedded on this reef structure within the first few months of deployment. And that's pretty interesting and amazing to me to see that diversity growth already within, within the first few months of this material being in the ocean. So it's, you really, you do get a lot of diversity of life pretty quickly on some of these reefs. And here's just kind of another uh, look at, at some of this initial diversity. This is another fish that is an older fish. This is actually kind of an adolescent gray angel fish. It's in a confused state of light. When it's younger, it looks a little bit different than this. And when it's older, it looks more completely gray. So this is kind of that mid-youth stage, but it's a big enough fish that it, it didn't, wasn't born per se on this reef. It came from somewhere. But again, the fact that it's here means it's probably happy with the resources that this reef is already providing in some of the growth on this reef here, some of this is sponge and tunicates and things. And, and some of that is what this angelfish would eat. And if we look even closer in this kind, of, kind of the nooks and crannies of this reef site, you can kind of see some more interesting things. And I, I, I like this slide in particular because you can see a lot of diversity of life in, in a very small footprint of reef. This is what I call macro shot. This is a shot where I'm looking at about six square inches of the reef. And so you can see a lot of things going on here. Um, we have some cardinal fish. Those are the red fish with the two dots. We have a butterfly fish, we have a wrasse, and there's a sea star. And then that little fish with the lines in it, if you can make it out, is a juvenile blue angel fish. What's interesting to me about this is these are fish that will likely reside on this reef. They may have come from somewhere else, but they will likely reside there and get to the point where they will reproduce on this reef. So that means within a first few months, we're already getting inhabitants on the reef that will become producers per se. And that's real exciting to see again with, you know, with, with reef material within a year. If you look closely at the juvenile blue angel fish, that's another point of interest, at least for me, that fish is small enough that it was probably in a larval form very recently. To me, that implies that this fish probably settled out on this reef from a larval stage. 
A lot of fish, when they're very juveniles or in a larval stage, they're kind of in the water column and they float with the currents and they settle for various reasons when they find habitat that works for them. So my hunch is, is when I see a tiny fish like this, it means that that fish was in its larval phase, is in the water column, something cued it to reside in this habitat because it was perceived to be suitable habitat. So I find that very exciting. And if you're curious of what an adult blue angel fish is, I've shown a few pictures of them already. That's what that fish will look like when it's grown up. I'm not showing you this slide really to show you that fish though, although it is kind of a nice segue because when that fish I just showed you is 20 years old and it's on that same reef, that reef may look like this. This is a picture taken on a much more mature artificial reef between 20 or 30 years old in the ocean. And if I didn't tell you that, you, you may not recognize any structure because it's hard to recognize a structure because there's so much three-dimensional growth on the concrete rubble that's under there, you really can't see it. So this is what we anticipate most of our concrete reefs to look like after a very long period of time. And to be honest, at this point, they are very, very similar to our natural reefs. And obviously from these slides I've showed you and all this marine life we talked about, one of the big reasons we are involved in these artificial reef programs is because we think and we're pretty confident that they are very good for the marine ecosystem. But in addition to that, there's further benefits to that. When we build an artificial reef, we essentially create an offshore destination. We create a, resources, a resource for people to utilize, specifically fishermen scuba divers. Fishermen scuba divers like fish. A scuba diver may want to go down and see some fish. That's, that's what I like to I like to go down and I like to see all the beauty of the fish and the marine life. Fishermen may want to catch some fish recreationally. They may want to take a few fish home for lunch. How, but either way, when we build a reef like this, we're not only benefiting the marine environment, we are creating this destination that can be utilized by the local community and any potential visitors that come to our region. So that is a benefit to the county in a way that the county can relate to. Everybody wants to know numbers. And you got to translate the numbers. How does this make sense? Well, we haven't had a specific economic study done on artificial reef usage up in Northeast Florida. However, there have been studies done around the state. This one's a little bit older now, but it was done by UF and Sea Grant. And they looked at uh, an artificial reef usage in an area of Southwest Florida. And you don't have to really worry too much about all this, but the, the takeaway is, is their conclusion was that they're assumed from their research that the usage of artificial reefs alone, that means not natural reefs, just artificial reefs, is generating about $250 million expenditures in a year. And at the time, I don't remember, but they, they did estimate that there would be some proportional um, increase every year with inflation and additional use. So that's a, a pretty significant number. And so again, when the county benefits, in addition from all the other marine benefits I talked about is when people do utilize these reefs, that there is an economic benefit as well. And with that, I wanna show you another video and you have to apologize, you're gonna hear my voice in a lot of these videos. I'm, I'm the cheapest talent I could find. Um, but this is actually gonna show uh, quite a bit more insight to that reef project I just talked about. It's gonna show some more visuals of this particular reef and I think you'll find it interesting. In this video, we explore reefs that were recently created by placing recycled structures into the ocean. So you may be wondering why all these structures are being placed in the ocean. Well, it turns out that concrete provides a surface area for ocean organisms to attach and grow to. You know what, instead of trying to explain it, it's better if we show you, come on.
Now these new reefs aren't the only offshore destinations accessible from St. Augustine. In fact, there's many reefs just offshore here. For those with interest in fishing and scuba diving, these reefs are a must visit. Thanks for watching. I'm Joe Kistel, and stay tuned for more videos featuring the offshore and underwater world of St. Augustine. Well, I'll tell you real quick, because I think we got the time. Uh, part of that project, uh, that project was uh, funded through the Coastal Conservation Association. They're kind of a, uh, a nationwide fishing slash conservation group. And they had a funding relationship with Shell Oil. And we all know Shell's a big wig. And I don't really show it much in the video because it didn't pan out too much. But there were, if you looked in the video, you may have saw a couple small boulders here. Um, <laughs> Shell trucked over um, a, bar, a truckload of, of these landscape rocks from California to Jacksonville to, to add to this reef project. And when I tell people that, they think that's absurd. Why would you truck rocks from California to, to Florida? And they actually bought these rocks from a landscape place. <laughs> And it is absurd, it is. What, but it, it, in, in the grander picture, it, it makes a little bit more sense, but um, it, it didn't quite work out from a visual standpoint that I think they thought it would, but essentially what it was, um, we're obviously we're very grateful for Shell's involvement in the project, but what Shell was doing is they had a, uh, this new high efficiency truck they wanted to kind of do a prototype run across the country with. So they needed a load and it seemed like good PR to them if they would bring reef materials. and. And to be honest, the only reason Jacksonville was picked is because it fit their route. They wanted to stop in Jacksonville. So we, I don't want to take any credit for the project, but we got the project because it fit logistically in Shell's plans. But, but anyway, we, we put probably several thousand dollars worth of really nice granite landscape rocks <laughs> out in the middle of the ocean. So if anyone needs a few boulders for the yard, you know where they're at. Um, but um, anyway, there's a lot of interesting artificial reefs out there. I could talk about artificial reefs all day. Um, again, I think I've explained all the benefits, the environmental benefits and the economic benefits and the user group benefits. Uh, we've recently did another project as well where we sunk a couple vessels off of um, Jacksonville, but I don't have enough time to get into that today. But I do wanna talk a little bit about aircrafts. For whatever reason, we have a lot of aircraft bodies offshore, Northeast Florida. And a lot of them don't have any st stories on why they're there. So we kind of, um, 
got curious and tried to investigate some of these uh, several years ago. And it ended up becoming more of an, an involved project than we thought it would. But essentially we have aircraft that are more modern, you know, from the, the 70s and 80s. This is a, an aircraft that we did some investigation on. It turns out it was a Piper Aztec. It probably crashed in the 80s. Long story short, it was probably some sort of illegal smuggling flight is what we concluded based on the information we had. But um, this is one example, um, but we also have, and there's several planes out there of this genre and, and I, no one really knows for sure, but it, it seems like it may all be related to kind of sketchy activity. But it's a shame though, because this looks like it was an accident. Someone, the plane crashed and someone may have been hurt. So it's unfortunate to see this. But what's interesting about planes, especially the, what I call like a recreational plane or a, a plane that you know someone might fly other than a big commercial jet or military plane is their bodies are thin aluminum usually. So when you find stuff, the only thing that really usually is behind the, that's obvious is the engine like this because of the dense metal. But there's also um, older, aircraft as well. This is a radial engine. I don't know if you can kind of make that out from the image there, but this is something likely from the World War II era. And again, this was the most obvious thing at this particular site. There is some of the fuselage left. It's, it's not much left, but um, I don't know why it's out there. The people I know don't know why it's out there. I don't know if it was a training mishap. I don't know if the Navy threw it over the side of the boat for some reason or whatever, but at the end of the day, it makes for a very interesting dive. I, I love diving these aircraft sites for many reasons. One, I think just the mystery draws anyone in, just that you're trying to figure out why it's here and what the story behind it is. But two, from a biological activity standpoint, it's really amazing because you have so much life concentrated on a small object. And I, it may be more of an appreciation from a photographer, cinematographer. These are one of the best things for me to film because I can point the camera at one small target and I can see all this life on it. Whereas when I'm on a bigger reef, you kind of get a dilution principle where these fish kind of spread out over a much larger reef. You're on an aircraft that's all kind of dense in one spot. And we seem to find more octopus on aircraft reefs. We find more scorpion fish. Um, it may not be that there's actually more there. It just may be that they're easier to find because we're more kind of you know, toned in on what we're looking at. Um, we don't, I don't know the story behind this one, but there are other older aircraft out there in this World War II age, and they're great fishing and diving sites. Um, that first aircraft engine I told you about, I mentioned we kind of got into an investigation and we started digging around trying to figure out um, how that aircraft got there. And so we got in kind of this investigation, the media got involved, and once the media got involved, we got a lot of phone calls from families with missing airmen and their families, and it was, it was, said, um, we had these people calling us from all over the place, really trying to put an end to the story of their missing loved one. And I was very disturbed to realize how many missing airmen are actually out there. But anyway, it kind of motivated us to try to answer as any of these aircraft wreck bodies that we could as best we could. And we had people calling us saying, hey, look, my, my uncle Johnny took off from California in a Cessna. Do you think that's his plane offshore St. Augustine? I mean, it's not likely that, you know, I mean, they're just so desperate for closure that, you know, they're, they're not real rational. And, it, and, and CNN took one of these stories with someone from um, the Carolinas and ran with it and probably unnecessarily so. And it put a lot of attention on the program. But when we were doing that, we were contacted by some local fishermen that provided some other coordinates. And they said, we think there might be an aircraft out here. So he said, well, I guess we're in the aircraft identification now. We'll go take a look. Why not? And um, so we went and looked and we first dive we did on it, we found this tire. And sure enough, that pretty much concluded it was an aircraft to us. And there wasn't much else around, but we um, went a little bit further and came across this, which at the time we thought was a jet engine. And we presumed at this point, this was probably a military aircraft. It was much more robust. We did find some more pieces. And I don't want to tell you the whole story because it's long-winded. It is a good story. But long story short, we made several dives on this aircraft. And eventually, we, f we knew with some of the homework we've been doing at this point, and it was military, so we started doing some homework knowing that. We knew that there's probably data plates on everything. So we kept digging around, digging around, thinking we'd find some data plate with a serial number on it that might help us answer some questions. And sure enough, one day we did find this little piece that had some numbers on it. We brought it up and out of the 10 numbers on it, we were able to make out one of them. And that one number, long story short, led us through a series of 
you know, kind of crazy chases, but we were able to determine that this was an A7 Corsair. So that narrows it down dramatically because we know there weren't a lot of those and we knew it was military and it was a little bit more modern aircraft. And we were able to look at some records and we, we did find um, reports of an aircraft that went down in a training flight in the, in the early 70s. And so we were pretty convinced that was our aircraft at that point. And the first report we read that said the pilot had, had died in, in the wreck. And, and then we kind of got a little nervous because we didn't know how to handle that. And we did some more digging and then we found other reports that said no, that he, he had survived. And in fact, he had survived and had a very prominent military career. He ended up becoming a rear admiral. So <laughs> we were proud of ourselves because we were able to identify this aircraft. And the first thing I thought to do is, hey, I need to get a hold of this guy. So via the power of the internet and searching, I found his name, I found where he's at. And I, I was all excited and I called this guy up and thinking we had just did the best thing in the world discovering this plane. And before he could say much, he answered and said, hey, Bob, I think we found your aircraft. And it was complete silence <laughs> for the longest time. It was probably 30 seconds, but to me, it was the longest period of silence in my life. And just then, once it started getting silent, I realized that his perception of the situation may be different than mine. I started realizing, hey, look, this was a bad day for this guy. This was a training flight. It was his fault. He made a mistake. He hit clipped another aircraft. He put a $3 million aircraft in the ocean. So I don't know how he thinks about it. <laughs> so anyway, that's all going through my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? What did I do? And finally, 36 later, he, he, he speaks up and he said, I, I thought it buried that years ago. Anyway, he warmed up real quick. It was a real nice guy. We um, met about a week later. I gave him the data plate that we found to identify this aircraft. And then a couple of weeks later, we brought him down, we took him out to fish over the site because it's a really nice productive reef now to try to put some positive conclusion on the situation for him. And we brought a couple more pieces of the aircraft up for him. Um, so it was just an interesting story I wanted to share with you. So it, it is kind of fun to be able to identify some of these aircraft. Like I said, our goal kind of at the time was if we could provide some closure to some families, we would. However, we were not an operation that really knows how to do that uh, appropriately, although we were able to identify the two aircraft we looked at. Having said that, there's actually aircraft that had been placed in the ocean intentionally for the purposes of artificial reef creation. This is an image of uh, intruder aircraft, and this is a reef site that's about 30 miles due east and about 100 feet of water. This is the bow section, or sorry, the nose section, and this is just one of the aircrafts looking from another angle. Now, these were prepared for artificial reef creation, so a lot of things were removed intentionally for environmental reasons. Instead of talking a whole lot about it, um, I'll let you listen to my voice on another one of these videos that will explain this project in a little bit more detail. In this video, we explore a truly unique artificial reef site that was created by sinking military aircraft offshore St. Augustine. A6 intruders were impressive and effective attack aircraft utilized by the US Navy. They could carry and actually deliver a heavy bomb load, they could fly low, and they were capable of traveling long distances. However, with technological advancements in newer aircraft, production of the A6 was ultimately halted. In the mid 1990s, it was decided to utilize remaining A6 bodies to create a fish haven offshore St. Augustine. And in June of 1995, 44 clean and demilitarized A6 intruders were transported offshore and placed in the ocean. Right, so we're offshore St. Augustine today. We're over the intruder aircraft reef site, and we've already sent our scouting divers down. They're on their way back up. They hooked our boat in position for us and scouted things out for us. They're going to come up and give us a report, and myself and cameraman Larry, we're going to go down, try to get some really cool imagery of the aircraft bodies that are down there. So we're pretty stoked about it. Looking forward to these guys' report. What a freaking dive. The beautiful. Freaking four eels. Awesome. Wow. Angelfish, flounder, huge lionfish. Awesome. Oh, what a it's awesome. Beautiful. It's beautiful. So cool. <laughs> Yeah. 
These planes have been down nearly 30 years now, and they're just covered with life. You've got corals and sponges and things growing on the structures. And then we also have all the fish and the creatures down there, which are amazing. We saw moray eels, we saw big moray eels, lots of tiny moray eels, which kind of look like snakes, big angel fish, Almaco jack, really healthy lionfish, which are fun to harvest. And then the list goes on and on. Because of all this sea life, the Intruder Reef is also a great fishing location and is a favorite spot for St. Augustine charter boat captains. The aircraft bodies lie in 90 to 100 feet of water, roughly 30 miles east of the St. Augustine Inlet, and the site is accessible year round. This is one of my favorite offshore sites, and I am greatly appreciative for the efforts of those that help make this offshore destination a reality. Thanks for watching. So this last uh, subject I wanna talk about is a little bit about historical structures that are offshore. And I'm only gonna talk about one specifically, but the, actually there's a lot of interesting, very historic wrecks. When I say very historic, I mean even older um, wooden wrecks from a long time ago that the local group LAMP is doing some very interesting work on. And if you all ever have a chance to reach out to them and ask them questions about those sites, I would recommend it. Um, what I will talk about is a wreck known as, to the locals, as the bear wreck. This site has been known to divers for a very long time. I know it's been a popular spearfishing site and it's a popular fishing site for both recreational and charter fishermen. And, and I, don't, I don't know the history on why it's called the bear wreck. I, I don't know where that name came from. Um, but diving it firsthand, it doesn't really look like much. This, this actually is a section of the bow. This is a winch section. And I'm gonna show you another picture um, of some boilers here in a second. But the, there was an individual named Michael Barnett that had been looking into this boat for many years. And I think as far back as like 15 years ago, he was pretty sure that this vessel was the Cotopaxi. The Cotopaxi is a vessel that disappeared, I guess about hundred years ago now. And it was a popular vessel that got tied up in conspiracy theories with Bermuda Triangle and those kind of things. So it was, it was in the headlines you know, decades ago um, for all these strange stories on how to explain why it disappeared. And in fact, if you saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, there is a ship in the middle of the desert with the name Cotopaxi on it, I think implying that aliens put it there. So it's a popular vessel for in that regards. But anyway, my, this individual, Mike Barnett, for years looked into it, found some pretty um, convincing information that this vessel is actually the Cotopaxi. He worked more recently with a LAMP organization. Together, they both identified this vessel confidently as the lost Cotopaxi. So it's very interesting. Um, it's a really neat dive. You wouldn't really recognize it as a ship anymore. The most obvious components to it are the leftover boilers, which are still in really good shape. But as far as the structure of the ship itself, it's, it's kind of just a big pile of metal. Um, but it, it's, we did a scouting dive on it a little while back now, and I'm gonna show you some footage from it here shortly. And our goal was to scout, to kind of look for camera angles and all these other you know, technical aspects. And we weren't expecting the amount of marine life that we found on it that day. Uh, a lot of Goliath grouper, uh, just uh, a lot of, and, you, and you'll see the video here in a minute, so I won't say too much, but, um, but just really impressed with the amount of life on it. And I was, I was telling Mark earlier this evening, uh, my uneducated guess is, is that this may be, uh, have become a Goliath grouper breeding site. When we visited it, it was getting into early to mid summer and there was several Goliath grouper there and they were showing some color pattern differences. And, and I'm not a Goliath grouper expert, but I do know as they get closer to breeding time, which is typically a little bit later in the summer, at least on the other coast, that they do show some pretty dramatic color patterns. So I, I think there may be a possibility that this may be a site where Goliath groupers may be breeding. So I would like to show, this is the last video I promise. <laughs> um, I don't know if I've been talking this one, so you may be lucky, but it's just, I just want to show you guys what this wreck looks like a hundred years after it's been in the ocean.
So pretty excited. Today, we're going to dive the wreck of the Cotopaxi. The Cotopaxi is a vessel that disappeared in the 1920s with a crew of over 30 men. We're going to go down and explore and see what this ship looks like almost 100 years of being in the ocean. So anyway, that's that's the Cotopaxi. So if you all ever saw the that film with uh, that Steven Spielberg, I think, uh, well now you know the real fate of the Cotopaxi. And if you ever any of you guys are divers out there, I would recommend taking a visit to it. So we're kind of up in a little over 50 minutes now. So I'm going to sum up because so I don't have to hear me anymore. Um, takeaway is there are a lot of fascinating things just off our coast. I don't think that a lot of people are aware of it. So I, I try to take advantage of opportunities like this to enlighten some people to realize these amazing habitats we have and give as much of a backstory uh, to these things as I can. And, and my hope is, is to, if nothing else, at least uh, inspire some appreciation because I, my gut is, is if people are aware of these things, they appreciate them and they're more likely to make lifestyle choices that may help benefit our marine environment. I wanted to keep this a really good news, just an introduction of what's out there. I will mention some other efforts we would like to continue working on. Um, one is, is that we do want to continue reef creation, obviously for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, however, we do have a responsibility for the reefs we already have. We have we basically we create destinations and when we create destinations we're creating places that people utilize and we all know that anything that's utilized by humans needs some sort of maintenance program to pick up after them i mean imagine it if you go to a football stadium or anywhere and nobody comes and cleans up after everybody how much a mess would be there over time and unfortunately a lot of our reef sites artificial natural it doesn't matter if people go there it's the same result what happens is, is we do get an accumulation of basically leftovers from people. And generally what it is, it's, it's, it's discarded fishing line and anchor rope. And I say discarded, it's not necessarily that I don't think the majority of fishermen are just throwing fishing line over. It's just what happens when you fish, you line gets snagged, you lose 10 feet here and there. But what you gotta remember is a lot of these reefs have been fished over 30 years, decades and decades and 10 feet from every fisherman comes into miles and miles over decades. And that becomes problematic. Things get hung up in it, things ingested and um, well, you can figure out why that would be bad. So. Um, what we like to see is more hands-on cleaning of our reefs. Uh, we're trying to work with the county to step up that effort. And because um, so we think it's an important one. And we also think it's important to do awareness events like this to showcase what we have. Again, my opinion on that is as the more aware people are, the more likely they are to protect once they know how important these habitats are. So I will kind of sum up with that. If you guys want more information, I'm happy to take questions now. Um, I will put this up here if you're curious. We do have a couple books um, I do have a copy of each one here, if you're curious. I only mention these if you really want them. Don't think this really supports us. You could get these on Amazon. The only one that benefits financially is Amazon, not us, but that's where they're at if you want them. North Florida Reefs is just kind of a, a guidebook to some of these reefs we talked about tonight. It shows some of the coordinates and it shows some information on the local fish as well. And then Spike the Tugboat is a children's book where we animated the tugboat that we actually sunk and throughout the book, we show real images of the project and animated images as well. And the goal here was just to try to introduce kids into this kind of unique conservation uh, type of effort. And so I will leave it at that. And if you guys do internet or social media, these are different things if you would like to, to kind of pay attention. Our Kistel Media webpage has a lot of the video productions. Um, we have a Facebook for Tissiri, um, Instagram accounts. And these bottom ones here are, are YouTube channels for various projects. Uh, UW St. Augustine is where a lot of the videos I showed you tonight. We have other videos like that there. We've done some work with other counties. That's Destin, Fort Walton Beach. We've done some work with Jacksonville as well. If you guys are interested in camera things at behind the scenes, uh, UW PicVid is uh, another channel there. Um, so I will leave it at that. If we have time for questions and I haven't talked too long, I'm happy to take them now. And thank you.
I think he's going to bring a mic for you. We do have mics if someone uh, to help uh, project if anybody has questions. So. I don't know if I need that or not. But, um, <laughs> what type of artificial reef do you think is the most creates the most beneficial underwater? You said about the concrete. There's boats. There's the planes. Um, the simple answer to that is is anything we can get in the water the next trip. So typically. I was mentioning this to Mark earlier. Our approach is, is if it's, you know, we have limited materials we can work with. The rules are today we have concrete and metal. Either one of them works very well overall. Um, there may be some slight differences for each one, but in our situation, instead of scrutinizing, we will try to work with what's ever available and whatever resources will allow. The vessels are more attractive in some ways to the scuba diver. Um, a lot of scuba divers will travel to see a ship because it's recognizable. The concrete probably has a longer shelf life. The concrete doesn't, um, it, it's pretty solid. It, it kind of stays there for a long time. The ships in our, you know, temperate tropical kind of environment, they do kind of erode over time and, and will kind of collapse. From our Zoom audience, we have a question if you could comment about the freshwater spring offshore Crescent Beach. Did I mention, I, I don't know if I, I may have went over it, but I did want to mention what some of the natural reefs, a couple other geological features. And one was these, there's a freshwater spring right off Crescent Beach. Mark might be able to tell you more about that. I know that it's there. I don't know much about it. But there is also another interesting feature that's it's probably 20, I think it's about 20 miles east, 25 miles. There's a giant hole on the seafloor. It starts at about 100 feet. And if you imagine you're walking on the beach and you come up to a cliff ledge and it drops to 500 feet, that's what it looks like. It's known to the locals as snapper sink. It's just a giant hole in the ocean. There has been some research on it years ago. I don't know if there's been any conclusions um, of what is specifically, I think there's some thoughts it was a spring, um, but it's just very unique and random, this giant hole, you know, like I said, 20 miles offshore. But I, I don't, I, the question was in regards to the spring. I know it's there. I, I don't know much more about it. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Are there any shallow So um, there are. There, there, um, some people will dive the bridges, like in the intercoastal. Um, visibility is usually tough. Generally speaking, the closer to the beach you are, the more turbidity you get. Um, most of the sites we dive start. Uh, east of 10 miles. It just kind of happens to be that's kind of where we're focused on whatever project we're working at the time. But we typically dive between 10 miles and 30 miles is kind of is where we spend most of our time. And those depths are going to range from uh, 55 to 110 feet in that kind of area. So, so we hear a lot about <clears throat> coral reefs being under, under attack because of the changes in the environment in the ocean. Do you see any, any evidence of that with the reefs that you visit? Well, it's hard. I, I don't think I've dove the sites long enough to have a credible response to that. I mean, I, I know what observations I've seen in my time, and we're fortunate we can reference some of our videos over a long period of time. Um, I don't know that I'm smart enough to have noticed any obvious changes because we dive enough, maybe we wouldn't notice it. Um, but some of the fish that we see, like I mentioned the angelfish and things, those are typical up here. But some of these other fish we see are more tropical fish. So a couple of these videos showed what's called a pork fish. Um, in my experience, those are typically more of a, a tropical fish. Um, I don't know that that means anything. They may have been here forever. We don't see a bunch of them, but we do see some. We see Sergeant Majors closer to the shore down here in Matanzas. We're starting to see them. I think we've seen some as far north as the um, Gulf America wreck, which is closer to Jacksonville. As far as coral growth and everything, it, it's hard to say. Um, we kind of, the corals that we're used to seeing, the stony ones at least, are, you know, it's, it's pretty much one type of coral. And I don't know that I've seen major changes in that yet, or that I can speak confidently of at least. Uh, off Daytona, there's a thermal climb. Is there, the, the pictures were so clear. Is the water real clear? And is there a thermal climb off the St. Augustine? It depends which day you go. <laughs> and, and we, that's one of the things we, 
I have tried to spend years trying to predict the best time to go. What we've learned is we, we have no idea. The only way to find out is to go offshore. Some days are better than others. We've kind of learned with the unique filming we do over the years that we can film in kind of a subpar visibility with some certain camera tricks and some technology. Um, but there are days that where it gets real bad where you can't see you know, your hand when you reach out and that makes it hard to film. And that could be from various reasons. Sometimes it's from stormwater runoff or from tides that come out if you're close to shore. And sometimes in the late summer, we do get these upwelling thermoclines where the top of the water will be 85 degrees and the bottom will be 59 degrees. And then you'll have this, when you're diving, you'll be all excited when you jump in the water in the middle of summer and it's crystal clear. You go down and you're at 40 feet and it looks like you're gonna hit the ground, but you know you're in 80 feet <laughs> and then your feet just sink through this wall. <laughs> And it's just this cold water that just has all this turbidity. And, and, and we, we get that seasonally probably a few weeks out of the year. And it's just hard to predict when it's gonna come in. And what we've tried that we've had times where we will go out to do these filming events and you know, we're like, okay, we'll watch the rains. Our, our gut is if it hasn't rained in a while, hasn't been too windy in a while, we probably have a good chance. And we've tried that pattern many times and we'll go out when it's been dry and not windy and it'll be the worst viz ever. And then we'll go out on days where it's rained for three weeks straight and it'll be the best viz ever. So it's, there's no rhyme or reason that I can figure out. Is in, in one of the first slides you showed of the features in, uh, in the water, your map, way to the east of your image, there was a line of features going north and south. Just yes. wondering what that was. The red line? No, no, it was, you know, your little blue dots uh, well, there's some of those dots. I'm not sure how to get back to it um, from here. So a lot of those dots were, again, they're just GPS coordinates that we put in. So someone had noted that as a fishing site of, and that means there's some structure down there. Most of the dots that are farther offshore are kind of live bottom systems. There's a lot of shelves and, and uh, these ledges out there, but there's some other random things. I mean, there was a bunch of dots there, so I don't know specifically um, if there's one in particular you're talking about. No, 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 it was just, it was just a striking north-south. Yeah, that, that, that's falling kind of the, the live bottom because once you get farther out, you kind of drop off into the Gulf Stream. So the, the seafloor is kind of etched out there from, I guess, those water currents. That area gets a little deeper for our divers. We don't spend a lot of time diving that depth. You've inspired a lot of uh, divers on Zoom. So they're curious if you have any recommendations for our divers, dive charters offshore for St. Augustine? Uh, yeah, there's a few in town. Uh, St. Augustine has one, uh, at least one. Uh, Jacksonville, I think, has got a couple that's just popped up. I would just Google um, you know, St. Augustine and Jacksonville diving dive charters. They'll probably pop up. Yeah. Uh, th I can hear you, but I don't know if the mics okay, work. Well, yeah, thanks very much for your presentation. Matt. Thank you. I um, we've been diving a lot in the Caribbean and uh, in Central America and have noticed, as have most people, this influx of uh, inv or the invasive species of lionfish. You showed some pictures and said it was, they were fun to harvest. And I think uh, they are fun to harvest and fun to eat and delicious. But how much of a problem have you seen, if any, well, increase in the yeah. you know, population of lionfish here. And is anybody doing anything about it? Yeah, and, and I, I didn't touch on it in this 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 presentation, and I'm I'm kind of a little bit numb to it now because it's it's been kind of a known issue for a while. But across the state, lionfish are loud and proud in high numbers, and, and Jacksonville's no exception to that. Um, it is considered problematic. Essentially, these fish are in big numbers. They reproduce fast in big numbers and they eat a lot. And so what's happening is, is they are eating local resources and they're taking away prey fish from other fish. And so they are considered very problematic. And that's actually why I mentioned in that video that they're fun to harvest. I'm not a spearfisher myself, um, but some people do like to target the lionfish because it's a kind of conservation movement to get rid of these invasive species. And it's actually, it's interesting in that regards because you, typically with divers, you have kind of the gee whiz divers. And I think I fall in that category where I just like to go down and look at stuff. I, that, that just makes my day. You have that diver and then you have kind of a, a hardcore spear fisherman diver. And it's two genres. It's like Republicans and Democrats are just two totally different beasts and they don't merge well. Um, 
and uh, I'm, I'm not really saying it to be funny, but it, it just is what it is. But what's interesting since this lionfish thing came up, we have this whole other group of divers, as you will, and that's their sole purpose to get up in the morning. They go out and they, they go out and target lionfish. They won't spear anything else. They won't dive and take pictures. They go out and they catch these lionfish and you know, they either eat them and there's actually an industry now you can sell them. Um, but we do have them here. Um, yeah, they're just as much a problem here as they are anywhere else. Typically we see them in deeper waters. Um, however, on some of those new reefs I showed you around 80 feet or so, we did see, we are seeing some lionfish there, just not in huge numbers yet. But there is a pretty active dive community locally that is harvesting the fish. You're welcome. Yes. I'm curious if there's anything left of the gator bowl. Have you ever dove? Yeah, on yeah. It? I, I don't have any pictures with me today with it, but um, it's been a few years. The if you're familiar with what it looked like, the some of the major I beams are still vertical. Um, there's not much else in it. Most of it's collapsed. Back when it was more new, there were still toilets in it and everything. Um, but it's, it still holds a lot of fish. It's a fun dive. And it's right next to a ledge system too, so you can see a little bit of both. Gator Bowl press box. The... It was placed offshore in the 80s, 90s, early 90s. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Mark and I were talking about Red Snapper before the presentation. Um, there, it, there were some, and, and I know in the, the reef video, I'm talking about there were some in the video. Um, in that reef video, one of the first static shots shows these double T's upside down, and there was a pretty big one that swam by. And I think there's some smaller ones. I, we have plenty of video that show tons of Red Snapper. I may just not have included that today. Um, we see a fair amount. Um, it just depends on the dive. We usually see them in pockets though. It's not like we go down and see them like maybe some fishermen may think we do. It's not like we go down and they're just everywhere in our face. Usually what happens will be on one side of the reef, we'll swim to another side and there will be a significant school of them in that one area. I don't know if they behaviorally act different when we're down there and maybe separate from parts of the reef, but we, we do see a lot of red snapper. There's no doubt about that. Um, especially in that reef area I showed on the map where we built those other artificial reefs. There's quite a few there. And I always tell a lot of people in many season that that's maybe a good area to, to go if they're looking to catch them. You're welcome. Okay, I think um, we'll uh, let Joe go home uh, <laughs> and as you as well. But I was, um, I was really heartened to see the bio biological diversity that exists right out there. And who knew? I mean, when you, yeah. when you see those pictures of your boat going out there, yeah. you see nothing. Yeah, and then uh, you put your face in the water, and uh, there, there's such—it's teeming with life. It's really very heartening. I really appreciate you taking the time to share that with us. Appreciate that. And let's give him one more round of applause uh -huh. and thank you, very much thank for you. coming. Thank you. And um, hopefully, we'll see you next month. I think it's the 16th, April 14th. Uh, 14th April 14th. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you.